right, all right. Good to see all of you. Welcome to City on a Hill. And uh, what we do here is we preach through books of the Bible. We are tonight in Jonah chapter 3 as we head through the book of Jonah. So if you'd like to uh, locate that in a Bible or device, it uh, would be fantastic. I was uh, picturing uh, at the end of chapter 2 that, I don't know, it just feels like God's leaders, God's prophets are some silly people. I mean, like... I was picturing Jonah just walking up on the shore in some whale puke dripping off of him and thinking, yeah, that just kind of matches up with the leadership here at this church. <laughs> Most church leaders I've ever known, just kind of silly. I have, a, um, I have a, an acquaintance, a pastor, friend in Kentucky named Kyle. And uh, Anybody um, have any men in your life that they just don't like to read the book if they get something new? Like... They're going to put something together, not read the instruction manual. It's just kind of, kind of a dude thing to do sometimes. Well, Kyle, uh, his children talked him into buying a new dog. Well, that wasn't the, what had an instruction manual. This was back when invisible fences were brand new. And so they bought one of the first invisible fences for a dog. And, and uh, his wife was the one, as usual, in all these male-female stories that had all the sense in this story. She kept saying, Kyle, why don't you look at the book? What is, you know, this is new. Nobody's ever had one of these before. There, this was before YouTube videos where you could find out how to do most anything. And so she is the one with sense, and he's the one going, no, we're just going to figure this out. And so he wanted to know how much range was on this thing. And so he got in his car and put the dog's collar around his own neck. And drove up to the end of the street, and, and they're going to do some experimenting here, because he said, figuring it was just going to be a little tingle, um, I'm going to drive down the street. When I honk the horn, hit the button. There was a test button. And so he starts down the street, uh, well-meaning, and everybody thinks this is going to go fine, and he honks the horn, she hits the button, and it blows juice all through his neck to the point where he seizes up. The car begins to careen to the left, which now causes a problem because there's a car coming the other way. And of course, when a car is coming over into your lane, what do you do? You blow the horn. So the oncoming car blows the horn. The, the obedient wife now goes, bang, hits the thing again. And so he goes a little farther into convulsion. Now he hits the accelerator. He's closing up distance on the car, and now the car is going, oh, oh, and she, the obedient wife, is banging the button every time, man. So the long story of that story is the silly pastor ends up in the ditch with a wrecked car and second-degree burns on his neck from being foolish and silly. Kind of looks like Jonah <laughs> puked up on the shore. Stubborn men trying to lead in God's kingdom uh, sometimes get difficult lessons. That'll be funnier when you get home. You can kind of process all those horns uh, with Kyle ending up in the ditch. He loves telling that story himself, by the way. So um, you get uh, Jonah, such a fool that God had to set him in a big fish to straighten him out, right? And he had rebelled and refused his assignment. If we just kind of review uh, God told him to go preach to the arch enemy of the Jewish people, the terrorist who had killed and plotted, and, and basically the only thing we have close to the Ninevites, uh, the Assyrians were, in our current world, would be like ISIS or Al-Qaeda. And so Jonah gets told to go preach to the ones who are abusing and killing and murdering his people. He refuses. He rebels. He goes the opposite way. None of us have ever done that, I know. And his uh, reward is that he gets thrown into the sea and he prays to the God he's mad at since death is sure. Anybody ever done that? While angry, you pray to the God you're mad at because <laughs> you know you need rescue. He's been rescued by being swallowed up by a big fish, and now he's been puked up on the shore. And most scholars believe that the word puke here in the original Hebrew uh, shows that while God has rescued Jonah, he's still not pleased with the angry condition of his heart. And so I believe that God wanted him to start walking to Nineveh with a bad smell 
because there's more work to do here. He reminded him that his heart still needs refining. Anybody in that boat tonight? No? You're all perfect and walking straight with like Jesus. Fantastic. You see, Jonah had, has been sent to bring a salvation message to a people that he hates. Racism at a very high level. You see, if people have hurt you and you continue to want to hurt them back, it's going to form a form of racism toward them in your soul. That's why God doesn't play that. He says all people, even your enemies, are to be loved with the goodness of Jesus, and you can term it racism, and therefore God's displeasure is on Jonah. And so he keeps Jonah in some muck, uncomfortable And probably some of us in this room are angry and wondering why our life smells like a big fish. Jonah's heart stinks, and so we pick up the story. You ready? Chapter 3, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, the message that I tell you. So it was basically God saying, what part did you not understand when I gave you that same exact command before? We could have saved ourselves a whole lot of time had you just gotten in the boat and done what I told you. Glad, I'm glad he's never had to do any of that with any of us. Had to give us a command for the second time. You know, like, like a command, like, you know, like love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, you guys have this memorized, all that you are, right? How are we doing with that one? How are we doing with that command? I mean, like, if you had not done a good job with that today, would it have been appropriate for God to throw you in the midst of the sea (laughs) to find obedience? Command, go into all the world and make disciples. Be involved in my church planting, my discipleship all over the world, how are we doing? And so I know these commands are difficult and the last thing I want to do is guilt you to, tonight. That's not what is going on here. But until we see our actual circumstance like Jonah, that we see that without God's rescue, death was sure, that the passage that Josh read tonight from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is only for believers. I mean, when if, believer, if you're not a believer in this room, then death is still on you. It still has sting. And until we realize that Jesus' work on the cross is our rescue from that death, and we actually apply and believe that into every command and area of our life, only then can those difficult commands become natural. See, it is our disbelief that keeps them from being the attempts to be natural. And so therefore we're trying to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Instead of trying to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, when we receive the love of God, love of God flows back to him naturally. It becomes who we are. It becomes a transformed heart. It becomes something new, actually, not something we're trying to make new. I know that sounds like a broken record, but it is still true tonight as it was last week, as it was when this was written. Remember Jonah's prayer in the fish? He committed himself to obedience to the Lord out of sheer amazement at his salvation. Remember he was on the bottom of the ocean. He was looking at mountain ranges on the bottom of the ocean with no possible chance of living through it and at that moment he committed to obedience when the whale came or the fish whatever came and rescued him he recognized God's care for him his love for him and even though his heart still has remnant anger in it he he commits to obedience 
Mercy had come. Jonah had deserved death for his disobedience. It was not undeserved that he was on the bottom of the ocean. God would have been completely just to leave him there. Some people say, well, God wouldn't be cruel like that and send people to hell, or he wouldn't be cruel like that and not rescue them from death. There's nothing cruel about it. It's just. The wages of sin is death. The curse that was put upon us is death. When we are disobedient in our sin without belief in God's way of redemption, it stays upon us. So Jonah had looked straight into hell and instead gotten a rescue that he did not deserve and a beach. He now is not only rescued by a fish and now he's back on dry land, fresh, new start. Anybody ever kind of felt like that sometime after God set his hand upon you that all of a sudden there was this feeling, there was a fresh new start. That's where Jonah is. He smells really bad, but he has a fresh new start. So here's his response to a difficult assignment. I cannot emphasize to you how difficult and impossible this assignment was. Nineveh is huge. It is not the size of Arnold. It is the size of a major city in the United States. It is massive. It takes many days to walk through it and deliver the message. But it's mainly difficult because of the condition of his heart. He has a he has a remnant anger in his heart that a good God is trying to heal. And so if anybody's in that boat tonight, this could be good for you. Verse three. So Jonah arose. That's a good verb. That's a good verb. In response to God, Jonah arose and went. Another good verb. To Nineveh. According to the word of God, obedience has come. Not perfect Jesus obedience, but obedience. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Three days journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey and he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And you read that and you go, it doesn't sound like that big a deal. I'm about to make it a big deal for you. 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. First comment is this, so much for attractional church planting right there. Like this is not like showing up, Jonah does not show up with a cool band and, and you know, like build a slide into the children's ministry. Bouncy houses at the church picnic. This is not attractional. This is not an attractional message. No, he has a simple message. You may have heard this from maybe your grandmother's church. Turn or burn. His message is turn or burn. In 40 days, what he just told him is you're Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Ninevites would have heard about Sodom and Gomorrah. Can you picture how that would go if we did that now? Like, you know, like right out on the streets of Arnold here, like somewhere between Quick Trip and Chick-fil-A. We get a little foghorn, a little bullhorn, and, and we go, hey, knuckleheads, in 40 days you are toast. We'd be called insane, right? We would be called insane. We'd be laughed off the street. But to get a picture for how difficult it was for Jonah, I'd like for you to picture this. As, as crazy as it would be to do that on the, on the streets of Arnold, how about if the call was to do it in Tehran, Iran? Or how about it's 1944 and we do it in the streets of Berlin in Nazi Germany? Or we do it in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, where within 30 seconds there would be a sword removing a head? This is a difficult message. But it is not the softness of our message. See, people think, man, you can't like deliver this hard core message. People will run away. It's not the softness or the hard coreness of the message that brings salvation. It is the power of the spirit of God. What's our job? Our job is to do exactly what Jonah just did with whatever our message that we've been given to give is. Our job is to be obedient Spirit saves. Jonah was given this message, turn or, a turn or burn gospel. And, and if you think about it, it was good news. 
for the city of Nineveh to be told, turn or burn, that was good news. That was actually a blessing to have a prophet walk into your city because they were scheduled for Sodom and Gomorrah destruction in, in 40 days. It was coming. 40 days from that day, it was going to hit. And so God has actually offered them grace here. Sworn enemy of his people, he offers grace, just like you and me, the sworn enemies of God are offered something we don't deserve. And so if they were scheduled for hell unleashed like Sodom and Gomorrah, any way out was great news. It was not good news. It was great news. Because the sulfur coming and fire coming down from heaven would be followed by a death which would land in hell. Hell is real. You understand that we now have three full generations who have been taught that hell isn't real. And so for us to say we're going to preach and teach the word of God in some kind of way that possibly might support that is, is a spiritual abuse to you and to our children. That is spiritual abuse. The question is, for these folks, will they be different than Sodom and Gomorrah? And believe. Uh, let, me, let me just flip Genesis 19 open for you so you can hear the result of, of what happened to, in that place that this is a direct reference to. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. He's leaving Sodom and Gomorrah. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew, underline if you have a Bible, overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what even grew on the ground. There was not even any plants left. Here's why I say that is the word for the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is the same one used in the gospel message that... Um, Jonah just delivered to Nineveh, overthrow. Same Hebrew word. If you go back to Genesis, the same Hebrew word in Jonah. The Ninevites were scheduled for the same fiery end as Sodom and Gomorrah, where even what grew on the ground would be dead. But it's okay to talk about hell. It's okay to talk about sulfur and fire. It's okay to talk about God's judgment because you will never fully appreciate God's good news until you understand his bad news. Our big idea is this. Salvation comes to others when we obediently give the message that we have been commanded. Jonah is actually really sweet to the people he hates here. But I hear people say all the time, yeah, I'm really not sure what to say. What is our command? Uh, and honestly, that is excuse making. Possible, it is possible that you've not been discipled, you've never been taught in a church what we are to say, but we're going to take away your ignorance if you hang around here. Usually it's excuse making. People say, well, I don't know enough about the Bible. We don't need to know the Bible. We just need to know a simple message. Jonah's was eight words. God gave him eight words to say. And, and hundreds of thousands of people were saved from eight words. Because the eight words didn't do any saving, Jonah didn't need to know anything. He was obedient with the eight words. He was given a simple message. He was not trained to win an argument. He never went to seminary. He simply was obedient. He didn't want to. <laughs> His own heart hated what he was doing, but he did. And I thought we'd just have a little fun here. Let's see how his message would fit the simple gospel message of we are rebels that are scheduled for eternal destruction. Jesus died to take that destruction. He has risen to show that the destruction cannot hold him. So I wrote this up for you. Here's a little letter from Jonah. Here's what it might look like if Jonah walked into Arnold tomorrow with the same message. Because of all people's disobedience, we too are scheduled for fiery destruction. But there is good news. Jesus took the sulfur and flames of God's pure judgment for us at the cross of Calvary. Is anybody excited about that in this room? Like you were scheduled for sulfur and fire and flames and he took it on the cross of Calvary. Next. 
He died so that we would not see fire. And he rose victorious from the dead to be a living savior and bring his righteousness and start our eternal life now. Sulfur and fire will come when he returns, but those who have believed will be satisfied and safely with him. Signed, Jonah. Okay, that was more than eight words. So God's better than me. You need four words? We can go, we're going to go simpler here. We're going we're to keep going progressively simpler here. Here's four words. The answer is Jesus. Say his name. Proclaim his name. Proclaim what he's done. The answer is Jesus. Need, need more simple? Here's a picture. The fires of hell, sulfur against Sodom and Gomorrah is intended for us. That's us. Some weak, tattered, broken sinner. And there's Jesus on the cross of Calvary holding those flames off of us. Simple. But true. Simple, but true. See, when God sends you, and you are obedient with his message, that simple gospel message, you can put it in your own words, but it is something like we rebelled, we got kicked out, Jesus has won us entrance. Without him, we will see destruction. With him, we get to be with the Father. We get eternal life. We get love. We get a family. Something like that gospel message. That's good news. When God sends you, people respond. When God sends you and you are obedient, people respond. See, somebody did that for you. You understand that somebody was your Jonah. You were the Ninevite. We're the Ninevites in this story. We're not Jonah. We're the Ninevites. And, and somebody was Jonah and came and gave us a simple gospel proclamation that the Spirit used to change us. How did these terrorists of Nineveh respond? These multiple thousands of people who have nothing good in them. Don't even pretend to have anything good. How did they respond? Verse 5, and the people of Nineveh believed God. All of them. The people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Wow. A simple eight-word turn or burn proclamation and the power of the Spirit has just won an entire civilization. If you would see the grammar in Hebrew of verse five there, the first word in that sentence is believed. God, God wanted you to know how instantaneous the Spirit won their souls. Emphasizing instantly, they were cut to the heart and believed God. That is how we are saved. That is how you were saved. If you have been saved, we are going along and we think one way. We're thinking one way. For them, it's I hate the Jews. I hate the God who supposedly loves the Jews. Matter of fact, let's kill all the Jews. That's the way they thought. The spirit of the living God hit them. They 180 repented, I love the God of the Jews. In a moment. That's the way it works. They believed for us, we um, have simple things like we think the American dream is going to save us. If I just get the right job, if I just get the right career, if I just get the right, right wife, if I just get the right husband, if, the, if God would just give me the right children. Matter of fact, these demons I have now need to go somewhere. And if, if, I, if all of these circumstances get just right in the American dream, I will be saved. And in the next instant when the Spirit hits us, we see how, how, what a house of cards that is. We see how false that is because people don't make very good gods. That husband or wife I was looking to, that, those children I was looking to for my salvation, they at some point will disappoint me because people make horrible gods. And we see how hurtful and false the career was 
the business was, the college education was. We see that putting our hope in that has nothing but a dead end and what hell actually putting our faith in that is and that only Jesus will bring satisfaction. And so we turn from the American dream and we worship him. Have you done that? Like, I, like, like this is like Jonah in the room prophetically tonight saying, Eight words, have you turned from that? Because the American dream looks better than the Ninevites, right? Because you'll have people say something like, well, I haven't killed anybody that's, that are walking in the American dream. I'm good. I'm a good person. So it looks better than the Ninevites. But all of those things that we put our faith in land in frustration because there's only one savior. I find it interesting that the Ninevites here were not intimidated into believing, right? What, what would usually cause them to make any kind of decision? They were a people of war, a people of terror. What would make them make any kind of decision? Somebody would have to bring war against them, right? There would have to be this mighty force come against them for them to change their minds about anything. I find it so ironic here that they were not intimidated into believing but they were changed by one prophet strolling their streets and the spirit used his simple message to turn their dead hearts to life. You understand that if you're a Christian in this room, you get to hang out with these folks someday. Like, like it's the coolest thing ever that you, you're gonna be walking around and you're gonna bump into a Ninevite and, and, and you're, you're gonna have this conversation about, yeah, I was... Uh, I had just gotten back from a little terrorist trip. He's going to tell you. I just got back from a little terrorist trip. We just hung up some Jewish heads on a pole, right? And this Jewish God of the, of, the, of the people that we just had murdered and killed came and won my soul, and so I'm here. I didn't deserve to be here. Holy cow, I found out how, how much I did not deserve to be here, but I'm here. Because for some reason, in my hate of him, he loved me. Is that not astonishing? I can't wait to have those conversations. I can't wait. You understand, you're going to have people that you can't stand right now that you're going to bump into. (laughs) That's so funny. But that's simply how it works. Salvation came to an entire civilization by God's work through an obedient prophet. I believe we just looked at Romans 10 recently, and that's what it said. How will they know unless you tell them? How will they know? And if you're a Christian, that's how you were saved. An obedient prophet gave you the message of the cross. And the Spirit won your soul. Convinced you it was so. And you responded in repentance and faith. These... um, pagan terrorist Ninevites instantly begin to take on forms of Jewish worship. They, they jump into fasting and, and sackcloth, signs of mourning, signs of an idea that I have been, I am guilty, that, that there is so much wrong with me as sin has hit their consciousness. You know, you know when we think we're fine in our sin, there has to be a day where the spirit awakens us that the sin that we're in is not fine. And these terrorist Ninevites are in full repentance and mourning. It has struck them that they have lived a life far from God. They thought they were right. And they found out that everything about them was wrong. And here's how you know you're saved. When you find out that everything about you is wrong and it feels good. You're glad that God has opened your eyes. Even the king, maybe the most, by the way, just to tell you what we're talking about here, this is probably the most powerful human king on earth at this time, the king of Nineveh. And he has believed in an instant. Verse 9, the word reached the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he starts writing. Anybody, when you encounter God, do you start writing? I would encourage you to journal. 
but he starts writing and he issued a proclamation and published, he sends out probably pu public criers and proclaimers through the streets. He says, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything. We're about to fast. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God, capital G, the God. Let everyone turn from his evil way, from the, from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? Look at this. God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. He doesn't understand the cross yet. But his response is, we believe. Somehow this powerful king, in a moment, has been humbled to say, all right, let's respond as I see overwhelming power. Somehow a, 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 a humble little angry prophet who doesn't even want to be there came with eight words, and this man has been so overwhelmed by the power of that that he is now crying out to that God, please let this deter your anger, we believe. Now, I got a question. Can he trick God there? Can he trick God? Can he go, God, we believe. Don't kill us unless it's actually happening. No. He can say whatever he wants. God is looking into his soul. So if God relents, he knows that their hearts have actually been turned. Like tonight, you can't trick him. You can say whatever you want. You can come participate in this communion as a public declaration that you are a Christian. But God knows the status of your heart. God knows where you are. And this king sees his own heart for what it is. He sees his sin. He mourns. He repents. He worships. And then he leads mission. Are you kidding? Follow me, people. Follow my words, call out to this God, pray to him, leave violence and love this God. He is the true God. He goes on a mission, all of a sudden he's the best preacher in town. This guy has probably ordered the death of hundreds of thousands of people and all of a sudden he is the best preacher in town and it's legit. Kind of sounds like a dude in the New Testament called Saul, doesn't it? who became the Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Romans, which we get to spend like the next 84 years in, starting here in a couple of weeks. It's going to take a while. Interestingly, in Genesis 19, back with Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot had issued this little weak human call for repentance for the men of the, you know, remember the men of the city showed up and they were going to rape the angels of the Lord. But God's eyes were not set to save that city. God's eyes were not set to save that city, so the Spirit did not bring repentance to the people, so the judgment of the Lord struck them down in literal sulfur fire. It happened. There was nothing left of the city. There was no one left alive, and not even plants. What's going to happen here? Well, here's what we know is that God is good, right, and perfect, and he always does what he says. And so look at this. Verse 10, it says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Lest you repent, you will be destroyed. They repent, and he fulfills his word. So, kind of interesting, who has been saved so far in this story? The book of Jonah is good news for people really broken people. Here's, is it, let's see, has it been the Joppa soccer moms? No, no. Has it been the good old boys who hang out at the local coffee shops and talk politics and emphasize that if you're one political view over another, you're probably a better Christian? No. You know those nice people? No. Is it the sweet little Jewish boys who try to follow the law that they're wearing on their foreheads? No. Anybody confused by that? Yeah, the little Jewish boys had 
the law actually attached to their forehead to try to remember to be obedient to it. So far, here's the salvation list. We have an entire ship full of pagan sailors who had about one million gods before they met the real God, and now they're believers in the God of the Bible. And by the way, God saved them in the middle of throwing his chosen prophet over the edge of the boat. He saves when he wants to. Let's see, who else? Oh yeah, um, an entire civilization city of Al-Qaeda and ISIS terrorists who hated God's people, including their Osama bin Laden leader, if you need an analogy to this. I remember back... um, I was around some people who were discipling me and we were talking about praying for the salvation of Osama bin Laden. And if that strikes you as something I would never do, you are Jonah. There's remnant anger in heart that you think that Osama bin Laden's sin is different than yours. and that you deserve a less destruction than he did. And we got to work that out. As God is going to work with Jonah through the rest of this story. The good news of the gospel is that the good news is good news for sinful soccer moms and al-Qaeda terrorists. But the story is to show us that even the worst of the worst will come to faith when the obedient message of his prophets, and that's you, hits the ears that we were commanded to bring the good news to. So here's what we know. The king was hoping that God would relent and not destroy. That should build our faith. That's your hope in this room tonight, right? I mean, you're not the king, but you're probably the king of your little world. And you're hoping that God will relent and not destroy. You understand that he set the same judgment on every person who would ever be born as he kicked us out of the garden, that sulfur and fire would swallow up all of us. And our whole faith is built on the fact that we know he will not destroy us Let me say that again. We know he will not destroy us because he has already destroyed Jesus on our behalf. Let me pray.